age of the laser has begun. The laser has conquered so many areas of our life and we can do astonishing things with it. And in 1960, the laser was quite simple. But nowadays, a lot of things changed and that is something you will see during the lecture today. Because what we're going to see here is a system which creates the shortest laser pulses in the world, so-called attosecond impulses. An attosecond is incredibly, incredibly short. It is, I want to use that word, it's a quintillions of a second. Have you ever heard that word? Have you ever used that word? I hadn't before. So it's a billions of a billions of a second, which is the speed of electrons. So this is something we're going to learn something about today, and which is really interesting. With those ultra-short impulses, we might even diagnose cancer in the future. The scientist that we're going to get to know later downstairs, where the laser beams is, um, his name is Kehan Goliath. He's from Iran, and he studied atomic and molecular physics at the University of Tehran, where he finished his bachelor and his master. Since August 2017, he has been working for the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in the division of attosecond physics. That is, um, the director of that division is Ferenc Krauss, and he's also a professor at the Ludwig Maximilians University here in Munich. So, as I said, attosecond physics is about very very incredibly short laser impulses to observe the fastest movements in the universe. Kehan's research focuses on uh, developing a method to measure the electric field of light. So you might be aware that light is electromagnetic wave, which means it has an oscillating electric and an oscillating magnetic field. So they are in a right angle to each other. So one is going outwards and one is going back and forth. So he is actually focusing on the electric field um, to study the ultra-fast dynamics of, guess what? Electrons. So precisely the electrons of band structures and solids. What that no means exactly, he will explain to us during the tour. But before we get to know more about Kaihan's research, I want you to meet Simon. Simon Reiger was born in 1988. Hi, Simon. Hi. He studied physics at the LMU, Ludwig Maximilians University here in Munich, and since then he has been developing lasers here at the MPQ, which I find quite exciting. I mean, have you ever met a laser developer? Have you? I do, for sure, you see that, but I find it quite amazing. So I do say a lot amazing today, but it's, it, it, I mean, like, I love working here because the research, the science, it is fascinating and I'm really happy that we can open up our doors for you today, invite you inside so you can get a feeling for what they do. So he at the moment is working on the automation of a new laser system and the alignment of the resonator, which he probably will tell us more about later. Um, so the goal is to create the super short impulses even more effectively. And that's why we're going into a clean room. And the laser is extremely strong in there. You see the laser warning lamp. So um, we also have to wear some glasses. So yes. now you can take over, Simon. Okay, so let me just grab my glasses. Okay, so I think we just head on and go inside. Yes, please. So, as you can see, we have a very new lab here. Um, it opened just two years ago. And maybe if you go here, then you see that this is shielded in another cabin. So this is basically a clean room inside another clean room. The thing is that um, our biggest enemy at the high power laser development is dust. At low power laser, dust is just annoying. You have to clean your optics with high power lasers. And um, our output here from the laser is 200 watts and our pump power goes up to a kilowatt. Um, this means your optics uh, get totally destroyed. The dust will burn in on the optics and you have a broken optic. Um, the cheapest one, maybe just 200 euros. The most expensive one go in the 10,000 range. So it's, it's quite a lot. So we try to keep everything as clean as possible. Okay, so follow me inside here. So, our big goal is, of course, uh, generation of attoseconds. Um, and the start of this is not attoseconds, it's just femtoseconds. And 
we're here basically at the beginning um, of our new setup and what you see on this side here um, is the seed of our system so here the the, the pulses are born which then get amplified uh, modified and at the end somehow transform to other seconds so here everything begins so this set setup is actually bought we did not develop this if we would develop also uh, our seed amplifiers, um, it would just take too much time. So this is always a, a kind of problem. What do you develop our own to, to the best of your needs, needs or what do you buy? And this setup um, actually we bought. Um, it's fiber based. Fiber based means that you have a little, I think you all are, um, are aware of glass fibers. So there is a, a doped glass fiber in there which generates the pulses. This is very reliable for low powers. This works perfectly. And <clears throat> after this setup, we actually just uh, go into our own developed Syndisk amplifier, which you see here glowing in some residual green light. Shall we turn down the sound a little bit? Okay. So we just reduced the flow box rate here. So, the amplifier here you see um, develops from nanosecond pulses, uh, millijoule, um, uh, from, from nanojoule pulses, millijoule pulses. Our output is around 2 milli millijoules at 100 kilohertz repetition rate. So, every 10 microseconds, we get an ultra short pulse of 200 femtoseconds. Um, the average power you can calculate this is 200 watts. Um, a femtosecond is uh, 10 to the power of minus uh, 15 um, of a second. So it's, a, it's just very short. Um, you can actually say the... It's, it's, I think it's best, better if you have a spatial um, um, image, uh, image of this. 200 femtoseconds in air means a pulse which is around 50 to 60 microseconds in length. So the pulse which comes here out is a, is a light pulse uh, way shorter than a human hair. Just think you, you switch on your, your light switch in your room and switch it off and you make it so fast that the, the amount of light which comes to you just has a duration of, of uh, a human hair in, in the diameter. So it's, it's more or less not, not for a human brain, it's very hard to, to, um, to, to see this in, in this way. So it's much easier to handle in a mathematical way. And um, the special way this amplifier works is a, it's a so-called thin disk amplifier. So the active laser material is just 100 micrometer thick. And what you see here, the green light, is a second harmonic. So the laser has a wavelength of uh, 10, 30 nanometers, so one over one micron. So it's not in the visible range. Red light would be around 600, 630 nanometer. You would see it. Blue light is 400. So that's the visible spectrum. So this, this laser um, is outside of the visible spectrum. We don't see it. The green light you see here is um, second harmonic. So the laser inside um, the, the resonator is already so strong that it actually generates a second harmonic. You can think of this like, like musical instruments. You know that you have overtones. A piano has different overtones than a saxophone. <laughs> And this is all due to non-linearities. So this laser, the light of this laser is actually so intense that it produces um, its second harmonic, which we actually, in this way, we don't want. It's just residual. We cannot avoid it. And <coughs> it's actually quite annoying because the, the green light, it's so intense, it, it might even hurt your eyes. And the nice thing, if you have a laser which produces um, invisible light, is that you can, um, you can wear goggles which do not annoy you because they don't shield visible light. So we actually can see through these goggles quite well because the cutoff um, uh, is, is um, so that, that it doesn't um, yeah, annoy us uh, with the visible light. Um, what you see here, um, if you maybe zoom in, is a Chirp mirror compressor. Um, <coughs> the output of this laser is so intense that it would actually destroy all our optics. So what we need here um, is a way of lengthening the laser pulse so that the intensity actually is distributed over a longer time period. And this is called chirping. So we can actually just um, grab 
this little graph I made here, so we see what it means. So you see actually um, this green laser pulse here, you see the fast oscillation of the electric field and in blue the envelope and you see a red one here. And as you see, the red one has a higher amplitude. It has a <coughs> higher intensity, what we call it. And this is due to optical compression. So the blue one here, uh, the green one, you see that the oscillation here in the beginning are spaced in a greater distance than here. Here you see faster oscillations. So this means the, the first, um, the, the later part of the pulse. So this part comes later, this part is the rise of the pulse, this is the fall. So the, the, the faster components are at the trailing edge, the lower oscillating components are at the leading edge. This is a normally chirped pulse, so the frequencies are not evenly distributed over the whole pulse. This effectively leads um, to a broadening in time of the pulse. And this is what we use in our amplifier, because otherwise the pulses would be so strong it would immediately destroy our optics. But we want the intense pulse, so at the end we have to recompress it. And this is basically what we again do with this chirp mirror compressor. So each of these mirrors, for the human eye, it looks like a, just like a normal mirror, mirror, but what it effectively does, it has a longer way to go um, for certain frequencies of the light than others. So, so to say, the, the blue light travels a shorter wave through the mirror than the red, the red light. This means effectively some waves overtake others and form again a very, very intense short pulse. And this is the way um, more or less all our lasers work. It's the so-called chirp pulse amplification. And <coughs> by, by this way, we always shorten and lengthen our pulses in time. Um, another way, um, um, I think it might, be, it might be better if we go around here, yes. Another technique here you see in this chamber. So this chamber is actually sealed off. It has a lower pressure. And what, you, what happens inside here is that we basically give focus and refocus our laser beam. So here about in this area, of course you can't see it, um, we have a lot of tight foci um, of our highly intense laser beam. Inside this chamber is actually a noble gas. We have argon inside here and we actually use the non-linearity of this gas. So this means our laser is so strong that the field strength of the pulse is around the same as the electrons have in an argon atom between the, the electrons and the nuclei. So the laser pulse actually drives the electrons in an argon atom. And this is so strong that it does not have a linear relationship anymore. So what happens here is so-called self-phase modulation. This means um, while the laser pulse propagates, it actually modulates its own refractive index. And mathematically this can get very complicated, but what it means is that the laser pulse develops more spectrum. So it actually generates its own new frequencies. And as you may have heard in, uh, um, when, you, um, when you did some Fourier transformation, the more frequency spectrum have, the shorter you can make your pulse in time. And this is exactly what we utilize here. So we go in here with a pulse with 200 femtoseconds and we come out with a pulse with only 40 femtoseconds. So we <coughs> actually can, can generate a lot more spectrum out of our small band pulse. So we go in small band, come out broadband. So there's the question, are there any losses during broadening of the pulse? Yes, there are. The thing is that this, this broadening, as I told you, is a, is a time thing. So um, the pulse, while it propagates in this very, very short amount of time, generates its own spectrum and actually gets longer. But this also happens in time. So the Gaussian shape of the pulse, the, the tightly focused beam, actually gets a little bit destroyed and you have diffraction losses. So you have al always something which is called uh, space-time couplings. So you cannot always keep your, your so-called Gaussian beam forever as a, as a more or less endless propagating uh, a laser beam. Nonlinear media will always couple in space and you have diffraction losses. So this, 
has around, we lose about 5 to 6 percent. There was a, a question earlier. Um, is this CEP stable? Um, our seed actually is CEP stable. Um, we had a lot of stuff planned with it, but actually we lose CEP stability in the amplifier. What is CEP? CEP means basically that mm, we should get back to our little little plot there. CEP is the so-called carrier envelope phase. And as you see, this is a single pulse. And this fast oscillating carrier wave inside there does not necessarily have uh, to have this phase relationship. In this case, the highest peak of the, of the carrier wave is actually at the highest point of this envelope. But this carrier wave could move inside. And actually, these pulses are independent. So for each pulse, 10 microseconds after this pulse, another pulse comes. It does not have, does not need to have the same phase relationship. So the CEP is a global phase. And if you have CEP stability, then this fast carrier wave actually is the same for each of your pulses. And this means complete dispersion control, actually. So this is the, the hard thing um, in this amplifier. Since it has 200 watts, you have a lot of thermal fluctuations. So as you know, maybe you know the in a desert, you see flickering of heat waves at the, at the horizon. This happens here in a crazy amount. The, be the, the 200 watt beams generate so much heat just by heating up the air and you have thermal, thermal winds over the mirrors. So this would destroy CP stability in a few milliseconds. And we actually did not achieve this here. But since we will use different nonlinear processes, we actually don't need it here. It would be a nice to have, but it would cost so much time to achieve and we only have the setup now that we actually decided to go on with other seconds which do not depend on CP stability. But maybe this comes later. After um, my talk, Kehan will tell you a lot more about CP stability because for high harmonic generation, this uh, CP phase of a pulse is actually very, very important. What I really would like to know is you are really developing something new here, right? So next we're going to go into the other clean room that is already creating these impulses. Mm -hmm. So a question is, why is it necessary for, to have this new buildup and what will be the major changes? What will happen with it? Give me a second to plug in. This is uh, maybe the, the, one of the most important questions. Why we have all this when we have just in the next lab, a working setup which already creates high harmonic generation. I need to go a bit into detail here. The lab, the lab uh, next door uses a, a so-called TiSaf laser, a, t a titan titanium-doped sapphire crystal. This, these these, these uh, solid-state lasers were the workhorses for years. They're still expensive, but they're in a way easy to buy off the shelf. But their main problem is power. You may, you may get out 10 watts with, with a lot of effort, 20 watts. Um, the problem is that these, these titanium sapphire lasers, um, they need a lot of pumping lasers. They develop a lot of heat in the crystal. To get a good beam profile, it is very hard at high powers. So what does it mean? What does low power mean in this way? Low power mostly means low repetition rate. So these lasers have a repetition rate of 1 to 5 kilohertz in the, in, the, in the lab beside us, which is actually working. This means if you have very, very um, sophisticated experiments with low signals, you need a very long integration time. You might need to measure for half an hour. So these, these kilohertz pulses need to be integrated up <coughs> to have a, a signal so strong that it's, it has a good uh, um, signal to noise ratio that you can work with. So one of the things you always wanted to have was a high repetition rate, uh, high harmonic source. And this was just not doable with titanium sapphire lasers. So they needed a completely new approach. And since Ethereum YAC amplifiers, this, this laser here is Ethereum YAC based. So here you have actually below this lid is a thin disk of, of active material. It's a Ethereum 10% 10, 10 ethereum doped disc pumped um, by a diode laser, everything this which is reliable and cheap technology. It actually comes from the industry 
from welding, from material processing. So this, this, this thing would work. You, you can leave it on over the weekend. It, it, it will just work. The problem is that the pulses are very long. You cannot get really, really, really short pulses out of your laser. And this was always the, the major problem. These long pulses, they need a lot of so-called post-processing to, to generate other seconds out of it. And this is more or less what we do. So we have a chain of spectral broadening, recompression in time, spectral broadening again, recompression in time, and all this, of course, in a, in a reproducible manner without... All, all this needs a lot of engineering, to be honest. It needs engineering so it will last and, and does not break. We, we could develop stuff which, which maybe would work for a day and then would break. So the, the hardest part is doing it reliable. This is the, the major difficulty in all these tasks. How long have you been working on the setup and how much longer do you think will it take? I've been working on the setup already when we developed it at the LMU before it moved to MPQ. So I would say at least I did my master here in 2017. So over three years now. And the, ma the, the major difficulties were always the, yeah, the reliability and the engineering. So is there anything else you want to show me here or shall we go to the other lab? Um, I can maybe show you what my PhD is working on. Just a very short um, introduction. So what you actually see in this in this long chamber here, there will be a so-called hollow core fiber. So this is a fiber um, which is basically a tube made out of silica glass. Um, you see it actually laying here, just a very, very tiny fiber. Actually here on the bottom you see the fiber. Okay. Yes, this is the fiber. Um, and it has an inner diameter of 500 micrometer. And we actually focus the beam inside this little fiber. This fiber acts as a waveguide, much more, much like a, yeah, like a hollow tube waveguide, you know, maybe from, from your electrical engineering class for radar uh, stuff like this. And the beam will propagate inside this hollow core fiber for several meters and um, will be con confined to this waveguide and will there do the same like uh, I told you before, do self-phase modulation. And we expect to get out of this hollow core fiber with hopefully 200 watts and the duration of around seven to six femtoseconds. And after this, then we can really look into, into other seconds or different frequency generation or highly, highly nonlinear processes. Before this, it's, it's difficult. Okay. Thank you. Let's move on. You well, follow you. Okay, then just follow me. Yes, that's the here. So you what you actually see here There now we are very close. <laughs> <laughs> what you actually see here is a is a working laser lab and just, just for, just um, um, you have some picture to develop all this. It took uh, way over ten years, so um, we actually plan to have the same in the lab where we just have been. But it will take it will take several years longer to be in in a reliable and and working way like this one. Can so I have a look at the lasers? Can we? Um, I think we can. There's so many lasers. So tangible. So maybe if you have a look in here. So here you actually see a fiber. This is uh, a classical hollow core fiber which produces the white light. You actually see white light here from an infrared source. So it, it's got a broadened to a super continuum and is then sent down to the other second labs. That is very important because we're going to go downstairs in a bit and then we're going to see um, the place where the experiments are done with the impulses that are created up here with those lasers and everything. See a bit of, of residual blue pump laser for the titanium sapphire laser. Everybody who worked with titanium sapphire laser will, 
be very uh, will know this very well. Also back here, you see the intense <coughs> green light of the of the pump laser for the titanium sapphire units. Hopefully, at one day this everything in this lab won't be needed anymore because we switch completely to ethereum yak based diode pumped lasers so we don't need the sophisticated pump lasers anymore that is interesting can we film this i think people want to see mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Just follow me. Okay, I should mention we are going downstairs, so the Wi-Fi might be changing, which means that we might be offline for a second. Just stay with us. Don't leave us. We will be online again in case we're dropping out, but it's looking good. Wi-Fi is still there. So do I need my glasses still? No. So we can actually take off our glasses, and now you see which is very convenient. Simon again, I will give you that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we go. We may go to Kayon. I want to start with the first time that I saw the laser. It was 24 years ago. Uh, my father came home and he had something like this big in his hand. And he said to me, Kayon, come outside. I want to show you something. And then uh, we used to have this uh, water tower like 500 meters from our house. And then my father just pointed this uh, small thing toward the uh, tower and then pushed a button. And then I could see this really shiny burst of uh, red light on the tower. And I was like, uh, amazed because if you have like a normal flashlight and then you turn it on it uh, it diverges really really fast so you cannot see anything outside of maybe 10 meters away from your house but i could see something really shiny like 500 meters from ourselves and i asked my father what is this thing and he said it's a laser sun okay so then it took me like 11 years later to do some uh, experimental uh, uh, things with laser and it was when I was in university doing uh, uh, optics lab and then we had to measure the thickness of a piece of hair with laser diffraction and this was actually the picture of that diffraction that we took uh, in 2005 in our optics lab and uh, to me lasers are really amazing things because you can do whatever experiment and measurements with them and they are really really accurate when you measure with them. In 2017 I was really lucky to join MPQ because they had these really amazing machines and uh, great scientists here and a state-of-art laser that we could do really cool stuff. So here at this uh, uh, lab here we have these huge machines uh, that we call uh, autosecond beam lines and then in the autosecond beam lines we try to actually measure some uh, ultra fast dynamics in our uh, systems for that we need uh, a laser that has durations of uh, uh, femtosecond but in order to understand what femtosecond means let me give you an example so uh, if you look at this uh, picture here we have the fastest uh, cpu for the computers that we have today and then it's five gigahertz uh, uh, fast. So what does it mean? It means that it can do 5 million calculations per second. And it means that one calculation for this uh, CPU to happen, it happens in 200 picosecond. Now one femtosecond is 200,000 times smaller than this uh, calculation time for a CPU. So imagine that you have a CPU that can do one calculation in one femtosecond. It would be 200 times faster than the normal CPUs that we have today. Okay, so now that we know 
some ideas about how fast and how uh, short is one femtosecond. Uh, let's uh, see what we do. So uh, from upstairs lab, we get. Where is the beam that goes down? Is that so so this is the yeah from this tube. Yes, exactly. Let's go around. So yes, it's better. Uh, from upstairs lab, via this tube, we get a very short uh, pulse of laser around uh, 4 femtosecond. Uh, and it looks probably something like this, maybe shorter. But I wanted to just show you that how does... So if this uh, axis is time, and this is the pulse that we create. Uh, so in 4 or 5 femtosecond, we have some bursts of light and then nothing. Okay. And then for each cycle of our laser, we have around 2.6 femtoseconds, okay? And then we want to first uh, measure this electric field of light. And it's very, very uh, hard thing to do, but with the infrastructure that we have here, we can actually measure this thing. To, uh, now let's talk about how do we measure this thing. So if you can come with me, I have another plot to show you. So in order to uh, measure this uh, really short pulse of light, we have to take pictures of this uh, uh, light uh, step by step, like here, 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 uh, with a very uh, short time window. In order to make that short time window, we create a very even shorter burst of light that is like 0.3 femtosecond. So if imagine that one femtosecond is 200 times smaller than one calculation, this is even uh, smaller than that. So this really a small burst of light acts as our uh, uh, camera, basically. So if I want to measure something that really moves fast or really moves... Uh, uh, in like a, an in, Yeah, like an electron, exactly. Uh, you need to have a camera that is really fast, that, so the shutter is really fast. And uh, in our case, this XUV bursts of lights that happens around 0.3 femtosecond act as uh, the shutter or camera. yeah exactly your speed camera so we, we move this speed camera basically in time to get our electric field of light and it should look l something like this picture here and uh, uh, that was taken by Lefterius group uh, uh, years ago and then uh, what we do here we try to uh, improve these uh, measurement methods because in order to measure something like that picture, we need a huge vacuum uh, systems and uh, like big things like this time of flight is spectrometers and takes, it takes maybe like uh, 40 to 50 minutes to actually measure this uh, measurement. But uh, we tried to improve this measurement and then measured something that was even really faster than that. So this was done here around three months ago, I believe, and it took us like 30 seconds to measure this thing. If you see, at first there is nothing, okay, and then around maybe 10 femtoseconds uh, before the main pulse comes, the, the oscillations of the light starts to happen, and then here comes the pulse, okay, and then it goes away again. And it's really fast because it takes probably maybe around 30 seconds to measure such a waveform which used to happen like maybe 40 to 50 minutes and then uh, it's a great achievement. Now why it is important to measure the uh, electric field of light? Because we want to actually shine it on a material and then see in the material what happens in that material. Okay, imagine uh, again uh, our CPU. Okay, this CPU can be as fast as 5 gigahertz. Why? Because our electrons cannot move faster than that, okay? Uh, and we need to actually find uh, materials and some sort of dynamics that can actually uh, give us the possibility that the electrons actually move within the cycles of our laser. So if the laser is li like here, the electron uh, moves somewhere. Again, if it's like here, it goes in the other direction. And again, if it's like here, it goes again to the other direction. So why, uh, why it is important? Because if I have some uh, material that can actually 
uh, react to the change and oscillations of the laser by that frequency, then again, I can maybe have in future CPUs that can be 200,000 times faster than our systems here. So with these systems and with these measurements, we can actually uh, try to find the materials that have this, uh, uh, what we call sub-cycle uh, dynamics that uh, within one uh, half cycle of the laser electron actually do one thing and in another half cycle does another thing. And this was one of the papers that we published in 2016 before I come here by uh, Ann-Katrin Zomer and Martin Schulze that they showed that, okay, for example, the energy transfer from uh, the electric field of light to the matter actually goes with the oscillations of our laser and then it settles to the final state. And it was really a cool thing to do because you can actually show that there are materials that uh, in them uh, there are these dynamics that can go with this uh, oscillation. There was another thing that uh, my colleague Florian Zigris did and it's also another nature paper here that they showed that they can uh, magnetize or demagnetize one uh, piece of nickel uh, on a substrate of platinum which means that uh, by using a very short burst of uh, light femtosecond uh, laser basically you can demagnetize a matter what does it mean it means if i have a hard disk okay the hard disks are uh, slow because then you try to copy it takes like maybe two or three minutes okay and a hard disk is a, ma is a magnetic thing so you have to uh, change magnetization or to demagnetize part of your hard disk to actually uh, transfer some data now imagine that you have hard disks that you can actually try to change their uh, magnetization level uh, by the oscillations of your laser field then your hard disk would be really really fast so like imagine that you want to play some sort of game on internet and then uh, you have these hard uh, fast hard disks fast ramps fast cpus everything fast uh, graphic cards and then you probably you can play something real time that has a uh, uh, quality of uh, a super HD movie basically and it would be really cool so uh, what we are basically doing here in these setups uh, is to understand these kind of dynamics and see how fast they are and how we can use them uh, in future basically also another uh, applications of these things is that uh, what uh, basically they are uh, doing in the BERT project is that if they can uh, measure the electric field of light and uh, for example if you have a, a bio molecule okay then uh, when you interact the light with this bio molecule uh, 20 or 30 femtosecond or maybe even in longer time scales there are these uh, oscillations of these uh, molecules that happens and if we can measure them we can probably uh, do some uh, sort of what they call molecular fin fingerprinting and then this molecular fingerprinting may help us to in future uh, to uh, for example detect cancer so f lasers are really important from measuring a thickness of a piece of hair to uh, really ultra fast electron dynamics or detection of the cancer they can really be used in the best uh, manner as possible or detection of the gravitational waves for example Nobel Prize of three years ago uh, I want to thank Theodore Maiman for creation of the laser basically and it's I, I would like to ask the Nobel Committee to give him a Nobel Prize he's dead but he deserves a Nobel Prize. Hashtag Nobel Prize for Theodore Maiman, <laughs> So I'm ready for any questions if you're... There are actually two questions, but I would actually recommend that we go to one of the vacuum chambers as well, because we want to see one of the vacuum chambers. Because yeah. guys, you have no idea that technology here is just, it is stunning. And this is a vacuum chamber. So in our institute, there's a lot is, is we have a workshop that makes a lot for the scientists. So all these beams that you see over there, they are made by, uh, they're stuff made uh, by our workshop, right? Some of them, yes. 
to um, basically, yeah, to, so the vacuum is so perfect that even small particles can't escape. Yes. But the question, that, there's two questions, I'm going to read them for you now. There's what parameters should be enhanced um, for your research to get this faster? And the other one is what sort or type of material do you think will be suitable? Parameters that should be enhanced is that basically the time window of the uh, camera that we have. So I showed you these XUV bursts of light that they were like 300 femtosecond, okay? So we need to uh, make a lights that are even even shorter than that to actually do some sort of uh, what we call injection in our material to be even shorter than that so then we can access faster dynamics and then after uh, we can achieve that uh, we can easily uh, measure something some wavelengths from maybe uh, middle infrared 10 micron to like a couple of petahertz uh, or 20 petahertz or something like that so we really uh, wish that if we can really compress our laser pulses to even shorter bursts of light then it would be possible to get better results with that and then for the case of the materials uh, right now uh, for the case of detection we believe that if we do the detection of the electric field in the gases it's even better and more clean data uh, uh, but for the case of the fast dynamics in the solids uh, probably glass the simple glass would suffice probably so the, va the vacuum chamber is the place where the pictures are taken is that true uh, so basically the vacuum chamber uh, gives us the opportunity to see these pictures on our computer yes so here is basically what, uh, the, where, the, where the measurement is happening, basically. So th there are uh, streams of gas coming out. We ionize this gas, and then we try to accelerate this gas with our field that we want to measure. And then based on the different acceleration that this uh, electric field gives to our electrons, we take these pictures that are really beautiful and so there you are seeing basically a XUV camera that looks to the uh, a smart XUV pulse that we have. So any other questions? There is the question, can you explain how the short light pulses act like a camera? And how is this technology going to map the universe? About the mapping of the wow. universe, <laughs> the universe is too big to be mapped by these small lasers. So I don't know how they can be done, but... Um, uh, XUV pulse basically acts like a so uh, if I want to explain it really easily uh, I need to for example ionize something in some material okay some electron in in my matter in my gas probably okay and then uh, when I ionize this uh, electron with my XUV light uh, the electron that is created has the uh, temporal properties of my XUV light okay so the shorter the XUV light is the shorter the electron wave packet that I am creating and uh, now when I have a very short uh, uh, piece of electron uh, wave packet of electron then it can see the fastest oscillations of the larger electric field, the red one that we saw in the uh, second picture, okay? And then when it's, it's uh, so these uh, measurements happen in a delay manner. So uh, first of all, uh, at first my XUV light is, uh, for example, 10 femtosecond before the actual pulses, okay? So it creates something, and then because there is no uh, pulse, the electrons don't do any changes, okay? Then I move this uh, XUV light toward the regions that uh, in time there is the electric field of light. Okay. Now the shorter that this electric field of light is, the shorter the, a uh, the area of that uh, big electric field that can interact with my electron that I have there. So basically it only sees like maybe 
around 100 auto second part of my uh, electric field and since the wavelengths of my laser that I am trying to uh, measure is really longer than this like 200 auto second then uh, my laser is basically constant there so I have a constant laser uh, so basically if you uh, consider it as some uh, steps so a step 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 each uh, burst of XUV creates very short electrons that only sees a, a stationary part of the laser basically and then this will uh, be my camera basically there as the shutter of my camera I hope it, it's the easiest way that I can explain to our audience. So you see it is highly complicated what's going on here at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics. Our time is sadly almost over, so um, probably two more minutes. I just wanted to let you know tomorrow there will be another lab tour at 5 p.m. again. We are going into the division of quantum dynamics and tomorrow it's actually going to be a lab that does not have a laser yet. The laser will be coming later, but it's quite amazing because usually what we do is we use atoms but in that lab they use actually molecules so bigger units than atoms to um for for computer for com for communication and everything but isabel will tell you more about that tomorrow and she will explain to you why there is no laser yet and when it will be coming but um yeah lovely for joining us if you have still one more question please write it down we will let it run in until it breaks off anyway or Kehan, maybe you have something else to say otherwise what i can say is stay safe during this corona time <laughs> and what i can say is thank you so much um Kehan, for taking the time i think My simon pleasure. and Kehan both did it really really great they did a great job and i hope you understood some you might feel a bit like me i work for the pr department and i'm still learning so much and there it's you will learn more tomorrow and the day after that and during the talk. But, you know, I kind of get the feeling with quantum physics, you will never have learned at all. What do you think about that, Kaihan? Uh, we never understand quantum physics, as Feynman said. <laughs> we have Feynman said we never understand quantum physics, so we try our best to understand as much as we can. Great. So I'll take you around the lab for a second so you get all this to see one last time. So again, the vacuum chamber where the pictures are taken and the beam lines coming down supplying this whole place so let's optics so here it turns around and one of the laser goes here the other laser goes to that big machine over there also we have another uh, tube here that uh, uses a two micron laser okay uh, which gives us even higher energy xuv photons and right now it's not working but uh, uh, it can also do cool stuff for also molecules basically you can see lots of uh, cool uh, molecule dynamics here and this is another beam line here hopefully when the a port laser that Zan and Simon uh, showed us in the upstairs is operational. They send the light here and then they can do even cooler stuff there. <laughs> so that's for Simon's Accord. Yeah, it comes down from here. That one. Yes, the, yes. So, an amazing lab. It's huge as you can see. But they need all the space to use and create those impulses. So, thanks again for joining us. No problem. And um, see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>